Hello, everybody, and welcome to this uh, second European Polar Board and Apex webinar, where we will be uh, hearing about uh, the Arctic Council from Timo Koivarova, of the uh, who's director of the Arctic Centre at the University of Lapland in Finland. And he's also a member of the executive committee of the European Polar Board, where uh, I'm speaking to you from. I'm Joseph Nolan, and I work in the Secretariat of the EPB in The Hague in the Netherlands. Um, and as I say, this is the second uh, of these webinars we've organized jointly with Apex. Uh, last week, we held our first one, which was with uh, Yves Freno of the French Polar Institute. And he spoke about the Antarctic Treaty and the protection of the environment. Um, and you can catch up on that webinar with a video recording of it, which is available on the European Polar Board website um, and our YouTube channel. Uh, that's at europeanpolarboard.org. Um, but this week we're going north and we're going to hear about the Arctic. And so without further ado, I will pass over to Timo Koivarova, director of the Arctic Center. Timo, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Joseph, and, and uh, greetings to you all from the Arctic. So I'm, I'm, I'm uh, making this uh, presentation from, from Rovaniemi, uh, from the, the premises of the Arctic Center. Um, and we are about 10 kilometers below the Arctic Circle. Um, so we have very Arctic conditions, I would also say. So it has been varying from minus three to minus 12 degrees uh was a uh, the past past week and and it's it's very snowy here at the moment and and uh, looking very very much like uh, kind of arctic conditions let's put it this way so i'm uh, uh currently a director of the arctic center and and a research professor here we are about 70 persons in this building so we have five multidisciplinary research groups and uh, we have uh, our science communication unit and also our own exhibition and we are located in this uh, Articum building which is which is one of the major um, tourist attractions in in Rovaniemi Finland the northern northern part of Finland in Lapland um, many of our researchers have participated in various assessments of the Arctic uh, Council and I will I will come back to that at the at the end of my presentation and also many who, who have come here over these all, all of these years have come here as interns or, or doctoral doctoral students they have they have uh, gradually become part of the arctic center and and also um, um, participated in these arctic council assessments right let's go to the outline of the presentation what i'm going to tell you about so first of all how the arctic council has evolved so I'm going to try to in a fairly um, well it, it will take some time but 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 show the, the way i'm personally uh, interpreting how and why the arctic council has evolved the way it has um, and then i will do a kind of midterm evaluation where it is currently um, standing then I think that it's, it's in, in important to, to also locate it in, into the kind of general landscape of Arctic governance. What, what is the place of the Arctic Council in, this, uh, in, this, uh, um, in, in the overall governance of, of, of the various Arctic regions? Um, fourth, I will, I will then look into the, the kind of what, what's the kind of uh, place of research in the Arctic Council um and also how it is possible to participate in the research work or or, or type of a research work it's not not exactly the the type that 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 the kind of basic research but but it is it is a, a research work of of certain sort in the arctic council this is just something that the chose have wanted me to to address and and then then few conclusions so this is obviously the reason why we didn't um, 
um, see any real pan-Arctic cooperation uh, before, let's say, 1991. Um, obviously, there was a Cold War, uh, the, the Soviet Union and, and the USA, the superpowers were rivaling all over the world, also in the Arctic region, which was one of the kind of strategic hotspots because the, the countries are closest to each other, other they're also as neighbors. Um, so um, there was obviously this, this polar bear convention where the, the Arctic Ocean coastal states, so-called range states, uh, we were able to, to, to come up with a treaty, but, but it was, it was a, a kind of single instrument. In nothing kind of general cooperation was, was, being, was being done. Times were then, then changing when the Secretary General Gorbachev uh, came into power uh, in the Soviet Union and, and um, Glasnost Perestroika, all these reforms uh, within the Soviet Union that he introduced, and also the, the, the kind of Murmansk speech, which, which where he kind of outlined what this change, general change uh, that he introduced, what it could mean for the for the Arctic, not only in, in, in the in the in the in the Soviet Union at the time, but also generally for the for the whole Arctic. And he identified a few areas, as you can see in the in the slide, few areas where the countries could uh, uh, do cooperation, um, and I've highlighted that that protection of the Arctic environment simply because the uh, Finland Finland then took the initiative on the base of of the Murmansk speech of of of, of uh, Gorbachev to really um, look into the possibility of whether uh, the eight states, the the five Nordic states, Finland, Sweden, Norway, Iceland. And Denmark with its uh, Greenland and, and Faroe Islands, and then um, uh, uh, USSR at the time, uh, and, and, and Russia. Then after then, after that, uh, U uh, United States and, and Canada could could do cooperation um, in the area of of protecting the the Arctic environment. And um, after after couple of negotiation rounds, um, the countries came up with the Arctic Environmental Protection Strategy, um, which also, because it was it was uh, signed here in Rovaniemi, from where I'm also presenting now, so um, it, it was also called the so-called Rovaniemi process. And, and um, here is the Arctic Environmental Protection Strategy. <clears throat> It is important to to know about the, the about the the APS or the Rovaniemi process because it's it, it basically its, its foundations are still with us today in the Arctic Council. So so this longer perspective is is very well justified. So if we very briefly go into the Arctic Environmental Protection Strategy, so there was a Rovaniemi Declaration, 1991. Actually, it was still signed by the Soviet Union at the time, uh, June 1991. Um, there was the so-called. Um, let's see what that goes. There was the so-called um, senior Arctic affairs officials, uh, which were officials in the in the foreign ministries of the of the eight eight uh, Arctic states. That were coordinating the, the, the cooperation and, and making sure that um, that the uh, working groups and the, the, the ministry meetings are kind of kind of that the let's say that the the results of the working groups uh, uh, would be kind of channeled into the uh, ministerial meetings. There was a chairman chair chair state and and uh, during those times it was it was really that the, the chair state also had to provide the secretariat. Uh, uh, for the, the the duration of the of the of the chairmanship, the main work was done in these um, uh, four working groups. Uh, most of you are probably familiar with these, so mo mostly perhaps you you would think that these are Arctic Council working groups, but but um, they they were established already in 1991 and 1992 uh, as part of this Rovaniemi process. 
so and, and these are still the I would I would say that the the the, the most most um, crucial ones. Well, sustainable development working group as well. But these have been working almost 30 years, so, so there's a lot of lot of um, uh, work that has uh, been done in, in these uh, working groups. So the main work is, and, and from the beginning has has taken place here. Um, and um, at the time, at the time, really, the, the there was no rules for 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 state or intergovernmental organizations, non-governmental organizations, how they would participate. So they were kind of observers, but we didn't know exactly what were the rules, how to admit observers, and we did, there was no real guidance how they were to uh, influence the work of the of the the Rovaniemi process. They were influential, but but it was kind of just it was there was no rules about that and what is kind of important to, to recognize is that the the, the three um, indigenous peoples international organizations Sami council you know circum conference as it was at the time now it's nowadays it is a council and then the Russian Association of of indigenous peoples um, they were also as observers. Um, along with other other observers, and there was also a task force on sustainable development and utilization. So this is something that I have also tried to kind of emphasize when I have my argument is that not that much changed actually when we we transitioned from the this Rovani process to the Arctic Council cooperation. So. The Arctic Council develops on, on, on these kind of foundations of the of the Rovaniemi process, APS. And and as you can see, these these uh, four working groups will continue to be uh, very much the, the kind of core uh, activity also of the Arctic Council. Uh, senior Arctic Affairs officials became senior Arctic officials, not much change there. But this was a big change. So the permanent participants, the indigenous peoples, international organizations, they became, um, they they get got a very unique status in an intergovernmental forum. So basically, they are sitting at the same table as the as the states. And and now, when I was in in the in the Fairbanks ministry meeting, it does strike uh, as as very unique when um, the floor is open to to USA, and after that. Switching council, etc. So it's it's really uh, um, really interesting to to see and observe that, and they have a very strong role in in terms that 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 they may they were made as permanent participants. So um, they need to be consulted before any consensus decision making by the member states, um, and if they as a block, especially if they as a block. Um, um, are opposed to to any kind of motion for decision. It will not even even go in practice to the decision making. So they do have actual power uh, in the Arctic Council. Um, Sustainable Development Working Group became um, there was a long period where 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 the states were kind of trying to argue for its content, um, but it. Did become the kind of let's say the second pillar of of the Arctic Council, but as I have already explained, there was already a task for some sustainable development utilization in the Rovani process. <clears throat> and nowadays there are six um, six working groups. Also, the Arctic uh, Contaminants Action Program became a working group later in the years. So. Um, uh, also six um, permanent participants. And assessments as, as core outputs, um, this was the, the kind of, I would say, a culmin, culmin, culmination of, of the, the, the kind of the Rovani process, uh, the release of this AMAP assessment report, um, really looking into the, the kind of uh, uh, pollution issues, mostly from, from outside the region, but also from the within the region, and and um, and also establishing a way that these assessments uh, would come to be done 
after this first uh, major uh, report. So first they, they, there was a, a kind of a, a popular report for decision, decision makers and then, then a, a, a scientific uh, uh, report. So my argument was that till let's say 2004 there was not that much change from the Rovaniemi process to the Arctic Council but then because of these reasons and, and, and this is my my interpretation of the events as I was living them and I live, lived them through um, why and why also the Arctic Council started to to change so the reasons behind this change were were these that this kind of Arctic hype begins. So there was the the release of the Arctic Climate Impact Assessment, which really because it kind of showed that the the Arctic is a barometer of 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 climate change. It it it, it warms twice the rate as 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 global uh, uh, as global average, um, and the change there is 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 extremely uh, intense. So I have I have used the, the, the kind of um, uh, way to depict this as, as that our image of the region changed from from it being a kind of frozen desert as being a dynamically changing region. So I think that that was also of importance. Not only the science that that showed that the, yeah, yes, that the, the the region is actually changing in many ways, but also the way we perceive it. Um, Russians planted the flag underneath the North Pole in in August 2007, which caused some uh, diplomatic, um, uh, let's say, discussion between the states. But mostly, it was some kind of media frenzy after this that, that Russians are are invading the the sea, sea, seabed and and the resources there. And after month month. Only a month after this uh, Russian flag planting, there was a, a, a huge drop in the, the new rec record in 2007 September um, of the of the minimum uh, sea ice um, in the Arctic Ocean, uh, which which again kind of um, caused caused a lot of lot of uh, lot of consternation as to where we are going with climate change and how rapidly this is this is moving for, for further. United, United States Geological Survey made this evaluation in 2008 um, that 13% of the undiscovered oil resources and 30% of the gas resources would be uh, mostly in the offshore Arctic areas. And this, all of this kind of came, came together as this kind of idea of a gold rush. So the way I have been using this, is there was this idea that there is a scramble for resources, that that the, the, the climate change is melting the, the Arctic Ocean sea ice. It, it is open open to to um, um, there are lots of resources offshore oil and gas in the offshore areas, and now the countries are trying to invade that seabed for themselves. And also this was argued in foreign affairs that this, this might also lead to military um, military conflict with conflicts between the Arctic Ocean coastal states at the time. So this was, um, um, I would say that it was a total total failure of, of, the, of the media to, to understand what was happening in the region for real. But it is important to, to emphasize that these perceptional things cause many times also political uh, changes. And this is also what happened uh, in the Arctic. So what started to happen is really that, that um, we have the Arctic Council here, but then we have this new format, which is the Arctic Five. So uh, in Italy, at Greenland, they organized um, uh, a, a conference um, between the Arctic Ocean coastal states only, five states. They didn't invite Iceland, Finland and Sweden. They didn't invite the permanent participants, the, the indigenous people's organizations. And, and this caused a lot of consternation at the time because also the Illicit Declaration, if you um, 
if you look at it, um, there it doesn't only only state something that uh, it, it it can provide an agenda of action in in in, in some fields fields uh, of of policy. So at the time, it was really not known whether this would somehow replace or challenge the, the Arctic Council. It didn't challenge by the end of the day, but but at the time it was really uh, it was really um, heavily heavily analyzed. European Union um, 2008 suggested that um, in its resolution uh, uh, suggested that perhaps we could find best elements for um, governing the Arctic from the Antarctica and and from especially from the Madrid Protocol. And that again caused a lot of, um, let's say, angry feelings, and 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 a lot of kind of um, a lot of kind of aggravation from the part of the Arctic states that that the EU doesn't really understand what is going on uh, in the Arctic and, and and how Arctic can be governed. Um, and also, at the time, two thousand seven. China, Japan started to, to participate in the work of the council. Uh, it was only natural because they became interested in what is happening in the region. The only way that they they, they could have a kind of a access to, to, to some kind of Arctic governance was to become observers in the Arctic Council. So they were as ad hoc observers at the time they sent big delegations in. And this, this was a really um, stormy issue at the time in the Arctic Council. What to do with this? Because there was there were no rules about this. Who, on 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 the base of what criteria can we admit states, you know, non-Arctic states as observers? On the how how can they function in the Arctic Council? All those questions were open at the time. Right then, the Council's reaction. So so. This is the way the Arctic Council um, reacted to this, and this is my interpretation. Again, uh, want to underline that Council found a new way to to um, uh, um, work, which is that that it, it started to establish these temporary task forces with a certain mandate, and and most many of them at the beginning were really targeted at at catalyzing independent legally binding agreements between the eight Arctic states. So the first one was the search and rescue agreement that was concluded in 2011. The second one, one was then oil spills agreement uh, concluded in 2013, Kiruna ministerial meeting. Both of these are now in force between the eight Arctic states. And now in, in Fairbanks, um, now, when 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 the chairmanship uh, changed in, in Fairbanks from from the United States to to Finland, um, also the scientific cooperation agreement was signed, and um, and 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 that's that's now kind of under under the the the, the um, development. There was also internal um, changes to constrengthen the Arctic Council. Permanent Secretariat was established to Tromsø, Norway, um, and also these, um, the Arctic Council was able to revise its own internal rules. It was able to adopt rules that provide criteria as to what type of states and other entities, what criteria they have to fulfill in order to become observers. And also, uh, in 2013, it was able. The Arctic Council was able to change its internal rules to define how the observers can function in the Arctic Council, which then allowed in the Kiruna Ministerial meeting for these uh, also these non-Arctic states to be to 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 be accepted as as observers, full observers, um, other than the European Union, which is of course not a state. Um, European Union is still an observer in principle, and and actually functions pretty much like like any other of these other other observers. But 
in in key on the ministry meeting china india japan south korea singapore also italy were accepted as observers when these rules were, were clarified then um also the arctic council um started to directly or indirectly catalyze these independent um, arctic um, um, organizations so arctic economic council was established arctic coast guards forum was established and also so-called arctic um, offshore regulators forum mostly a kind of um, cooperation form for the for the for the for those national line agencies that are responsible for uh, oil spill prevention and and the interesting thing is here that that in 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 the in the red here is that the, when finland assumed the, the chairmanship of the arctic council in, in 11th of may uh, this year it also became the chair of these other bodies even though these are not part of the arctic council so so this is the so Finland became also the, the, the chair of, of these three other other uh, uh, international organizations. There are still some Finnish apparently left. So so this is the Finnish uh, chairmanship program uh, in short, um, and and just to me just meant to kind of kind of emphasize that it's very important. Um, in uh, institution uh, still uh, the, the the chairmanship uh, even if we have the permanent secretariat nowadays it is still the chairmanship chair country that um, really drives the cooperation forward and 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 here are the the, the finish kind of cross-cutting um, uh, priorities and and at the center kind of let's say the 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 priorities that stem from what is what is perceived in Finland as, as its main strengths, what it can, with which it, it can help the, the Arctic Council to achieve those environmental and sustainable development goals in the Arctic. Just to emphasize that, that the chairmanship is still very important. So midterm conclusion, um, so fundamentals of the Rovaniemi process still prevail. So also the, the Ottawa Declaration was, was not, not an international treaty. So the states didn't um, give birth to an intergovernmental organization regulated in international law, but it is still a soft law forum. Um, it is still a soft law forum. It, is, it doesn't have any automatic funding me mechanism. Um, all the decisions are made to be made by consensus. Um, no legally binding decision making is possible in the Arctic Council. It can catalyze independent legally binding agreements, but it cannot make uh, enact legally binding decisions. But at the same time, there are vast changes that, that I just pointed out. There are many, many changes. The, the catalyzing of these treaties, uh, catalyzing these organizations, uh, having permanent secretariat, etc. So lots of new activities, also a little bit too much activities, I would say. At the moment, the, the problem is that there are just too many uh, issues on the agenda of, of the Arctic Council um, for the current resources. I think um, it, it needs to be kind of um, underlined that, that the Arctic Council has given voice to indigenous peoples and it is seen as a model also for other parts of the world. And, and let's see whether it will have, have um, um, and it has also, I think, empowered the indigenous communities in the Arctic um, to be very active internationally as well. As also mentioned, has been able to catalyze legally binding agreements. So even if these are independent from the Arctic Council, still very, very um, much something that, that we couldn't have predicted. So me and other observers that, that had followed the, the Arctic Council for quite some time. I think most of us couldn't really foresee this. So it was really able to, to change the way it functions. So I was very critical still in 2007, 2009, that the Arctic Council is, is useless uh, for, for anything, basically. Well, not, not, perhaps not, not as dramatically as that, but, but I, was, I was critical. 
Then let's talk a little bit about how much of the Arctic governance the Arctic Council is doing. So we have to kind of understand that there is there is the Arctic itself is is governed by many layers of governance. So not only the nation states, their national rules apply and policies apply in the in their northernmost regions, but also there are subnational governance le levels, indigenous governance. Um, most of the global treaties are one way or the other uh, applicable in the Arctic or or the global uh, global uh, organizations have a mandate also in the Arctic in principle at, at, at the very least. I'm taking a couple of examples from those processes that are that are kind of uh, kind of more targeting the, the Arctic um, Arctic uh, uh, itself. So uh, this one this is the the, the mandatory Polar code and its scope of application. So, the, so the mandatory polar code regulates uh, uh, shipping in in these waters that that you see as delimited in in green here. So, and the and, and it also applies in the Southern Ocean surrounding the the Antarctica. Uh, so this this came into force from the beginning of this year. So so shipping issues are under the mandate of the International Maritime Organization and still continue to be so. Here you can see at the, at the middle, you can see the 2.8 million square, square kilometer um, high seas area. So this is a very sizable, really huge chunk of, 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 of uh, melting um, uh, ice and, and open waters already. Um, and if you think about, for instance, some of you probably follow uh, the process to to come up with um, with an with an international treaty to regulate how biodiversity is governed in the areas beyond national jurisdiction. So, if that treaty uh, becomes a reality at at some point in time, um, it will also apply in this high seas area here. What is perhaps more important to, to, to recognize is that this area is also all the high seas freedoms apply there under the law of the sea and law of the sea convention. So navigation is open, uh, fisheries, fishing is open, bioprospecting is open, and, and, and the area is melting. And I would say that most experts would say that it's already irreversible that we will see an, an um, ice-free Arctic Ocean, let's say, by 2030 to 2040. So this will change the, the, the use of the Arctic Ocean, obviously, but also the, the its ecosystems in a, in a fairly dramatic uh, sense. Here you can see that already a, a very sizable portion of the, the, the Arctic Ocean is already open water during the summer months. So, so already now it is in principle possible to, to do, for instance, fishing there by distant distant uh, um, fishing fleets that, that many countries nowadays have that can operate months in, 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 in the in the in the ocean areas. And and this is really the, the what what has what has been happening now is is that that um, and, and one process that I want want to kind of take up is, is this this Arctic um, high seas fisheries regulation. So I'm not going to go into the kind of kind of global framework. There is a global framework that that kind of kind of gives frame to this what is happening at the moment. It's called the so-called Straddling Stocks Convention, which is which is one of the implementing agreements of the Law of the Sea Convention. On the basis of that convention, um, the Arctic Ocean Coastal States started in, from 2010 onwards. They started to um, have diplomatic and, and, and scientific discussions with each other and meetings about what to do with the high seas fisheries, because there may be, there is not, not at the moment no, no commercial fisheries, obviously, but there may be uh, some fisheries. So should we do something? And, and these kind of culminated in, in 2015 with the Oslo De Declaration, where the, the, the Arctic Ocean Coastal State kind of committed 
to not have their vessels to do unregulated fishing in the in the in the high seas areas. Um, but this, this this process has now gone forward in the sense that that um, articles in coastal states five of them now invited also China, Japan, South Korea, Iceland, and EU because EU is representing its member states uh, in international negotiations over fisheries to further negotiate over how to kind of um, come up with a, with some kind of regulatory structure for the high seas fisheries. And, and the latest of this is that, that at least the negotiators are, are, are quite sure that by the end of this year, some kind of agreement could be arrived at. Um, we will see. But this is again just to illustrate that fisheries are not not uh, within the mandate of the Arctic Council, so these have been dealt with under the framework of global rules, but then on the base of Arctic Ocean coastal states and other uh, interested states for uh, fishing in, in, the, in these high seas areas. So the implications really, the Arctic Council, it's only, only one segment of Arctic governance. Um, it is the only governance forum where all the common Arctic issues can be discussed and, and, and advanced. So, so it is. It, it 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 can also, in a sense, even if it doesn't have fisheries mandate. Obviously, it is all the time promoting, uh, for instance, ecosystem marine ecosystem-based management, which has implications for fisheries as well. Um, the Arctic Council, its kind of mandate has, has broadened, but still it is limited to, and, and there are limitations, um, especially when there, when those are under the purview of, of some existing uh, bodies like, like the IM, IMO or, or others. And even if it has a mandate to do uh, something, it can only do kind of soft work, recommendations, assessments, etc. In many ways, influential, but still, it, it's not not like that. It can do everything. So this is just to to kind of to to have you understand that it has its limitations. This is really the niche activity of the Arctic uh, Council. Its scientific assessments. So really, um, really the kind of uh, scientific assessments over the, the state of the Arctic environment, the environmental threats to the Arctic environment, um, social trends, uh, economic trends in the region, those have been of crucial importance for different layers of Arctic governance, because these are feeding in to all of these different layers of Arctic governance and have been uh, at least uh, that's my interpretation, have been influential. Science in the Arctic Council, so so this has been clear that from the beginning, it has, it has been the running process onwards. From 1991 onwards, the Arctic Monitoring and Assessment Program has been the, the, the I would say that the most, the, the strongest of all the working groups and, and, and still remains so. And, um, and its assessments have really kind of been at the core of the work uh, um, to this day. There was, a, I think, after the Arctic Climate Impact Assessment, um, there was a kind of string of new assessments that, that it spurred because it kind of changed the, also the way we, we perceive the region. And also it became very crucial to, to, to evaluate what are the impacts of climate change then to, to to, um, for instance, oil and gas ass assessment was 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 done uh, in 2007 or 8, and then Arctic marine shipping assessment 2009, and then Arctic biodiversity assessment 2013, all all in which the the, the climate change obviously was a major driver behind uh, behind that. Most working groups conduct scientific assessments, so it's it's a clear dish activity for the for the Arctic Council and where it can very comfortably uh, function. 
plus that it's it, those those rec those scientific assessments come also with recommendations policy recommendations so it has found a way to also kind of connect that scientific work with the kind of policy recommendations which i think is has been very very useful okay now i will uh, move to my own own experiences just to give you an illustration um it is it is very difficult to say uh, how researchers can be involved in the work of the arctic council um across the board simply because um, very few of us have been working in all of the working groups let's put it this way so so i i can only share my own own experiences as to how i was able to be part of of these these uh uh, these uh, projects and, and, and assessments, what I'm what I'm listing here. Um, so my expertise area is is legal studies and 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 I would say policy studies, and and this is perhaps also one of my points is that when you come to the field of Arctic research, it's it's it becomes increasingly difficult to to retain um, or, or to remain in your own disciplinary viewpoint you are you are constantly kind of working with 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 colleagues from other sciences so this is the i think the interesting part but it can be also a disturbing part depending on on on, on what's your view of of, of science and, and and your personality obviously very 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 important in that so as part of the Rovaniemi process, there was a process to have these guidelines for environmental impact assessment in the Arctic. And since I was doing my doctoral dissertation in the 1990s, at the end of, of the, at the end of the 1990s, I was doing on on this uh, very topic. Uh, so I was invited to to take part in this, um, and and we had, for instance, in our town hall here in Rovaniemi, we had the second kind of negotiation negotiating round for these these EIA guidelines. Um, uh, importantly, it, it now Finland started again to look into this this specific topic of Arctic EIA. Um, uh, now I'm at the moment I, I I cannot be part of that, but my, my colleagues from the Arctic Center are are part of this this project as well. Then Arctic Human Development Report Number One, which was one of, one of the major deliverables of the Icelandic Chairmanship in 2004. Um, there I was, um, since Nigel Banks, uh, he, he was the lead author of, of the, the legal chapter, um, he became aware that I'm doing also uh, Arctic legal uh, research, so he involved me as, as kind of Finland's con Finland kind of, kind of con uh, country co contributor to that part, so that was, that was the way, way I, was, I was able to participate in that. Arctic Ocean Review, there I was mostly asked by the Secretariat uh, to, to kind of um, give my, because I had done a lot of work on, on Arctic marine issues, so marine governance issues, so, so to have a look at, look at what they had been doing, uh, uh, so, so my role was, was here more like a reviewer rather than, than, than participating in, in producing the content of that. Arctic Resilience Report was was an interesting process. Uh, it was um, I, I took part in this uh, socio-economic part. Annika Nielsen from the Stockholm Environment Institute invited me um, to to have this also this legal perspective to, uh, in this, and, and then I involved a couple of my um, my doctoral students who were working on these specific issues in this pro project. So they 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 were able to then then participate in, in this, this project. Task Force on Arctic Marine Cooperation is an ongoing activity. It's, it was started in the, in the US chairmanship, uh, so the previous chairmanship, and very much looking into whether it would be possible to do more kind of policy related work in the kind of, our kind of governing of the, of the Arctic Ocean in the Arctic Council. And in this work, I was, Part of the country team, I didn't participate in the meetings, but I was I was uh, participating inside Finland on on kind of defining our stance on on the proposals made by the United States as a chair of 
of, of, of this process. Um, Arctic Human Development Report number two. I was already that much senior that I was I was um, asked by 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 the lead authors to 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 um, um, take charge of the the legal chapter, and I also invited then uh, Nigel Banks, for, uh, who who was the the lead author in in ASDR one, as as my co lead, and then we had we used also the the art because I was at the time leading the Arctic Law Thematic Network. So we used that as a resource. So we had 19 contributing authors from, from all the eight Arctic countries and also from other countries uh, uh, kind of contributing to this. So, so that was a great resource. And I think we were able to, to do a good, good job with, with that ch chapter. Currently, of, co of course, so, so in Finland, we. We we started to prepare for the for the chairmanship already. Let's say in 2015, because we knew that it will come in in in, in May 2017. Um, we have a um, this funding call um, in the in our prime minister's office, which opens up annually, and it is targeted to 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 having uh, projects that that directly feed into kind of uh, political decision making. And one of these was was the the Arctic Council chairmanship, and 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 we made a bid. Our consortium that we lead in the Arctic Center, we had Finnish Institute for International Affairs and and Finnish Environment Environment Institute with us, and we won that. And we were we have been then doing um, already before the chairmanship started. We were doing briefings and and memos to the to the Arctic team. Um, uh, in the foreign ministry that is that is uh, driving the, the Finnish chairmanship at the moment. So already before the chairmanship started, we, we did uh, about the SDGs, the you know, United Nations uh, Sustainable Development Goals, and how they could be utilized in the Arctic uh, uh, Council um, about climate change and, and the Paris Agreement and, and how we can then revive the work, uh, climate change work in the, in the Arctic Council. Um, we also did a, a kind of fairly big kind of in Finnish a big kind of background report that was um, that was kind of uh, meant for also for general public not only for for these these kind of specialists so so that was really like 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 looking at, at what is the situation now when Finland receives the the, the chairmanship uh, what are the trends in the Arctic uh, what can the Arctic Council do about this these issues and and what can Finland as a chair do? And that was a big event. It was in in in, um, in February this year, and um, and then um, there was about 200 persons in in our parliament building to to listen to this. So I, I truly hope that that they they were able to understand a little bit better what the Arctic Council was after that event. At the moment, I'm also. Uh, um, so in the sustainable development working group there are there are two expert groups so there is an uh, arctic human health expert group and the social economic and cultural expert group and and i'm now the co-chair with sara tervaniemi from the sami council and what we are trying to do with with our members is really to find a new new kind of direction for this for this expert group and 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 what we are the the way i'm we are now driving it is really to to try to try to have our kind of expertise role um, and expert role in in terms of these sustainable development goals and and be a kind of a let's say a research arm that knows about uh, SDGs and how they should be applied in the Arctic conditions but this is still work in motion so so this is this is uh, um, one thing that one thing that I'm do, doing now in, in, in the current Finnish chairmanship and now we are preparing also for this Arctic Resilience Forum and Arctic Biodiversity Congress, both coming to Rovaniemi. I'm organizing the, this, this first one and, and then the, I mean, the program advisory committee in the Arctic Biodiversity Congress. So September, October next year, this will, this will be here in Rovaniemi. So, so you're very much welcome to, welcome to join, join the action. So some kind of, let's say fairly not so perhaps well thought out kind of my own impressions of how to get involved in 
in the Arctic Council in terms as a, as a researcher, I would say. So obviously it's voluntary and non-pay work. Most of it is is, is still um, that that there is there is funding to the extent that 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 travels and, and accommodation can be paid. Uh, in some cases, not even that. But what has been rewarding, at least to me personally, is that these these are these assessments are taken seriously by by policymakers, and you feel that your your work, of course, it's a teamwork always, but it does have a kind of clear value when 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 policymakers recognize it, and 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 you can see that it it really uh, influences uh, policymaking. Um, I guess that that um, the way if if one is really interested in getting getting to these assessments, um, it's really much about your own own, own willpower and, and your own expertise, and and obviously you need to connect to relevant persons and institutions. So obviously the secretariats of of these these working groups are are extremely important. Internship there would would already you know get your name somewhere um if you do a doctoral dissertation on these issues if it's relevant for a certain assessment it is very likely that somebody is gonna 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 invite you or or then then if not then you just just ask whether whether you could participate in that and i'm pretty sure that it's it's the the doors are open in general i think that to to keep up with the, with all the possible networks be active in those, uh, including International Arctic Social Sciences Association, International Arctic Science Committee, and these perhaps less known are these University of the Arctic's thematic networks, which are plenty, and 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 they are also a very good way to to get to know your colleagues, and and with that, some of those colleagues are of course all, also participating in those assessments, so in that way it's possible to get there. Right, so conclusion, um, as, I, as I've already stated, the Arctic Council has evolved enormously, even with this, with this kind of underlying thing that, that, that the, the foundations have not really been touched. So it, it will be interesting to see how long the Arctic Council can survive with these, with these basically foundations that were, were created in 1991. Um, how 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 long it can survive with these foundations um and as i said it was a pro uh, it was a surprise to me how how well and quickly the arctic council was able to to get up to speed when these challenges came um without any long-term strategy and now and this is something that i forgot to say um, Finland chairmanship is, is now working and, and leading the, the long-term strategy work. So, so the first ever long-term strategy for the Arctic Council is now in motion, and, and we are also this this consortium that that we are leading from here. We are also helping in that work. Um, our our team in the in the in the in the foreign ministry. But it has been able, without any strategy, it has been able to counter these challenges, at least to my mind. Its, its niche activities clearly are the scientific assessments, and um, and yeah, it's it's um, it's it's obviously I think that the most influential, um, um, for instance, the fact that 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 if you read the global convention, Stock, Stockholm, persistent organic potent Con convention, or or the Mercury convention, and you see Arctic. Uh, uh, Arctic mentioned there in the preamble, uh, you might be surprised, and, and it's very much because of these scientific assessments. And if you have real and expertise, you can get in, uh, you can get engaged in the, into these uh, assessment works, which are really, at least to me uh, as a as a researcher, they have been very rewarding. And here is our uh, building. I'm not. My my window is not seen in here, but but it's pretty much looking like this. Uh, and here you can see also the tube that is pointing to the north. So this is um, uh, one of the major tourist attractions. And and as I already said at the beginning, uh, we have 
So this is a very international house as well. We have 13, 13 nationalities currently and lots of interns. So, so the Arctic Center is, 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 may, may be also a place for you in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Timo. That was a, a very comprehensive uh, overview of the history and the, uh, the current uh, activities of the Arctic Council. Um, we now have a bit of time for questions. So if anybody has a question, you can either click a button to uh, raise your hand uh, and then I can unmute you and you can ask your question or alternatively uh, you can type your question into there's a there's a question box on the uh, webinar control panel um, so either way and then I will uh, make sure you're able to ask your question ah we've got one through already uh, from Heidi who asks uh, when was the Oslo convention and what was Norway's intent uh, do you mean Oslo Declaration? I I I presume so. Yeah. So so this is probably the what I mentioned about the fisheries, fisheries uh, negotiations and and uh, so 2015 was the Oslo Declaration, and with that the Arctic Ocean Coastal States committed that their fishing vessels cannot uh, go to the high seas if they are unregulated. So, so they kind of committed to to at least very responsible if there if there was to be any 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 um, commercial fishing. Um, basically, they they said that they are not going to do fishing um, in the high seas areas um, um, before before there is some kind of management structure for it. Okay, I hope that answers your question, Heidi. Um, at the moment, we don't have uh, another question, but I, I have a question. Um, that's, uh, are there any plans at the moment or any movements towards establishing any new working groups within the Arctic Council? As you mentioned, how they'd, uh, it, it, the number had grown with the introduction of ACAP. Um, is there any, any plans for any additional working groups anytime soon? Not that I am aware of. So, so I would say it's in in this way that that so so we used to have only the working groups and and they have become now now six. Um, then started this this kind of um, era of these task forces, which which used to be very plentiful and 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 they did a lot of work. So, so these are because working groups are kind of kind of ongoing activity. Task forces are temporary, and they have a certain goal to achieve, like like an, a legally binding agreement. Um, and then there are also these expert groups. So, so I would say that that there is no appetite at the moment because the structure starts to be. Um, I, I think that that most of the discussion is, is more about how to make the structure more more kind of manageable because it, it starts to be so many expert groups and, and task forces and working groups and and, and 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 all kinds of projects that are done with various constellations so i i would guess that that, that perhaps the more the, the question has been more about perhaps perhaps about merging about some of those working groups. That has been one line of discussion rather than adding any new working groups. Okay, so things are, uh, they're, they're trying to maybe streamline things a little bit at the moment. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, we have another question from uh, Wojciech. I'm, I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name. Um, he, the, he asks, uh, what is the Arctic Council, uh, what is the, 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 how important are they in the role of a uh, region building process? Uh, I'm, I'm not exactly sure exactly what that means. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, yeah, I can answer that. Yeah. So, so I think 
they are extreme. I mean, Arctic Council is extremely important in, in, in that very specific sense because there are no other organizations which have a general mandate over basically all common issues facing the Arctic, excluding the military security issues. And, and that exclusion was made in the Ottawa Declaration that military security issues should not be dealt with by the Arctic Centre, but all other common issues can be within its remit. So, so I think that that with the with with this kind of exclusion, it has also been able to kind of work during this kind of difficult geopolitical era that we are living. So we have the sanctions regime, basically all the other all the seven other member states of the of the Arctic Council are sanctioning Russia and, and Russia is counter sanctioning. So we, we do have a kind of, se kind of serious situation in terms of geopolitics, but it doesn't really reflect in the work of the Arctic Council because it is, it is very much those issues are excluded and, and, and those issues are, have, have never been dealt with or, or discussed in the Arctic Council. So it has been able to kind of, <clears throat> it has been able to really kind of build the Arctic region uh, with a certain focus, focus on sustainable development and these environmental issues. Okay, I hope that answers your question. Uh, we have uh, a hand raised here from Anthony. So Anthony, if you're there, I'm going to unmute you and you'll be able to ask your question. Anthony, are you there? It seems maybe not. Okay, uh, never mind, we'll move on. We've got another question uh, in the chat box from Anik. Hello, Anik. Uh, Anik asks, how is the scientific quality of assessments controlled? Does IASC play a similar role in the Arctic as SCAR does in the Antarctic? concerning the coordination of scientific programs? No, uh, I ask is, is I, I, I would say that the, those who are active within the um, Inter-Arctic Scientific Committee, they, they also, many of them participate in the making of these assessments, but they have their own kind of control mechanisms and review mechanisms and, um, and Unfortunately, I'm not not fully aware of exactly how this is done in the Arctic Monitoring and Assessment Program, which has done the most influential of the assessments. Um, simply because I'm I'm a, I'm a social scientist rather than a natural uh, physical scientist, but um, they I'm, I'm pretty sure that there are very rigorous uh, kind of uh, ways to make sure that the quality is is there. Uh, um, in those projects that I have been involved in, it's been just just um, uh, both um, uh, kind of peer review, but also um, government review of, of some of these. So, for instance, um, for instance, the Arctic Human Development Report number two uh, may may tell you a little bit different type of story. So. There we were confronted with, with governments asking very difficult questions from us because especially the security chapter um, was very difficult uh, simply because these issues for the from the viewpoint of the foreign ministries are very <laughs> sensitive. And, and, and so, so the, the security chapter, I think that there were at least three or four teams that tried to do it and they were thrown out simply because they, they, they were, from the viewpoint of the government, they were just doing something that was not there at all. And, and, um, and even the, the legal chapter got some, some criticism. I think that we, we, we felt that it was unfounded. And, and what happened then was that, that, that um, when, when, when the government's Kind of a, there were a couple of governments that were really um, having problems with some segments, and you can imagine that law is is very near and dear to the nation states. So, so they their foreign ministries ministries think that they know exactly 
how it should be interpreted. So our team um, was asked at, at one point in time that perhaps we could we could have also the legal chapter deleted altogether. Um, me and Nigel, we said that fine by us. I mean, if 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 this is the the only thing that is kind of kind of preventing this this report from from being being accepted, um, then let let, let 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 it be so. But um, the leaders of the Arctic Human Development Report number two, they made a decision that they are not going to be kind of kind of um, they are not going to um, bend in for this political pressure and 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 we were able to to have our chapter as as we wanted uh, as a, as a scientific as we felt that a scientific chapter and but it, it did cause this 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 effect that if if you read the the 2015 ministerial meeting you, you will see that it's not really endorsed by the, the arctic council it's more like welcomed so so there is also this delicate balance when it comes to especially social sciences that there is not only the, the peer review, the scientific quality is there, but there is also the, the political um, political kind of review and, and, and criticism that can, that can come and, and, and kind of... Um, um, I think that it's, it's a kind of, for, for me personally, it, it has been it has been a positive message that, that, that the governments are actually taking this very seriously. And, and in this case, we, we then needed to just say that, okay, this is more like a scientific product. And the Arctic Council then doesn't endorse it as theirs, let's put it this way. That's a very good answer, I think. I hope that uh, answers your question, Anik. Uh, we've now got uh, Anthony is uh, got his question on the on the question box after his uh, after the microphone didn't seem to work. So okay, Anthony asks um, that Timo suggested that in practice, uh, Arctic Council makes no decisions without permanent participants, even though the principle of the the Arctic Council operates on the consensus of Arctic states only. However, permanent participants have been traditionally concerned with limitations to their participation in, at the Arctic Council because of funding or access to certain kinds of expertise, which suggests that their concerned decisions could be made without their full input. And what do you think about this, Timo? I think it's a valid, valid concern and, and um, has been there from the beginning. If you think about these organizations and 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 the, the the scarce resources that they have and 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 not many people working um, for them, let's put it this way. So obviously uh, they cannot have the same input into everything, but they are there. They are there in the ministerial meetings. They are there in the SAR executive committee. None of the working groups can come to the SAO executive, executive, executive committee, for instance. And and having seen that action, for instance, SAO executive, executive committee, it was really interesting to see how much they were able to do. And obviously, they have also expert help with them. So, so it's not all that. I mean, they they, they are very strong actors. Um, um, if one considers how small entities they are but i think that you are right in in and and I, I i guess that no one is doubting that 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 obviously they would need much more resources and 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 especially monetary resources and this is something that also was 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 agreed in the the, the observer criteria that that financial assistance should be, should come also from from these let let's say non arctic states observers to the arctic council but they haven't been really forthcoming with those with those finances. That's that that's unfortunate. So I, I do agree, in in principle, that that obviously there is there is kind of practically uh, there is uh, problems um, in how they participate. I think that almost by necessity, and they will not go away even with with full resources. They will be uh, become let's say less 
less kind of kind of um, less uh, concerning. But um, but I, I guess that it's it's very important that because in in those when there are big decisions made, uh, if and, and many times when they have become um, they are concerned of, of 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 something a big issue for for member states, for instance, member states do not they do consult the 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 the, the permanent participants fully, and they do acknowledge that that if they are all against that they they will not go forward with consensus decision making. Um, that's really the <laughs> that's really uh, um, impressive to see, I think. Okay, I, I hope that answers your question, Anthony. Um, the moment we don't have any new questions. Oh, yes, we've just got one from uh, Yoko. Uh, Yoko says, thank you for this introduction. Um, uh, and they wonder what kind of jobs uh, the members of the Arctic Council have while serving for the Arctic Council and that they didn't know that they were volunteering for this work so what what kind of positions do the people have um at their own national level while they are uh, while they are completing uh, work for the arctic council so for the arctic council itself it's mostly the civil servants that are representing um in these different working groups and and, and in various levels and 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 the foreign ministry if if it's a, like like now finland is a chair so it's 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 basically there's a seven member team in our foreign ministry that are leading um also then persons like 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 who are let's say in the interface between administration and research like let's say Finnish Environment Institute is a good, good example because it has also um, also kind of um, uh, legal obligations um, uh, and kind of gov gov government um, obligations um, they can also represent uh, Finland but but in those kind of official positions it's, it's mostly the, the civil servants diplomats who are there but then when it comes to these kind of um, assessments they are being done they are being coordinated from these these kind of working groups but then the the the, the population um and the the kind of the kind of group of people who are working for those it's it's really much um um it really kind of comes comes from from the from the expertise and and and, and from this kind of voluntary based nature of, of of the of the assessment work and and yeah I, I don't i'm not totally sure if i fully uh, fully understood the question but but uh but that's that's approximately my what, what i think about it i think i think that uh, answers yoko's question um i th yeah it seems it seems to me that uh the the way that this work the work for assessments and so on is voluntary it is uh, yes, the yeah. people the but the people are researchers or in other positions themselves so uh it's kind of additional to their own regular work uh, and, and especially now in, in my my kind of line of work and and in those assessments where i have been it has been really flexible and 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 there's a, a, a fair amount of openness to to involve um, researchers. Obviously, you need to have something to give to the table; um, otherwise, it doesn't function. So the expertise need to be there. Okay, I hope that answers your question, Yoko. Um, at the moment, we don't have any more questions on the chat box, uh, but I have another question. Hmm. Um, and that's uh, what kind of relationship does the Arctic Council have with uh, regional organisations, either within at a kind of sub-Arctic, uh, you know, with a, a Nordic level or a North American Arctic level or smaller scale, um, and with uh, other regional organisations in other parts of the world? 
Yeah, there's um, there's some some which have been resolved in in such a way that that for instance the the Northern Forum that is um, representing many of the subnational governments in in the in the Arctic and and the Circumpolar North. Um, it is an observer to the Arctic Council, and and there has been a, a long-standing discussion whether since the, the the indigenous peoples organizations have such a strong status in the Arctic Council. Why is it that the, those subnational governments that actually do Arctic governance, why are not they involved in there? And there are also very good rationals for making that argument simply because when you have recommendations, if they had been party and part of making those uh, recommendations, they would also be more likely to to implement them. Um, then there is, um, for instance, the the IASC is a is a is an observer. So mostly, it's it has been resolved in a way that 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 uh, the relevant organisations um, um, try to become observers to the Arctic Council because that's the 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 most general level where where all the kind of governance levels can discuss so i would i would guess that that's the approximate answer okay yes that's a good answer thank you uh, timo uh, we have another question from anthony again uh, who asks uh, what conventions are developing around coordinating the work of Arctic Council and the Arctic Economic uh, Council and is there any effort to formalize the relationship between these two organizations? Um, at the moment I don't think that there is any legally binding agreements um, on the pipeline so so this um, a scientific um, uh, agreement. So, the, so the, basically, that that agreement tries to 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 lift the obstacles for making uh, for for conducting science, for instance, in Russia, or the border um, border um, formalities, etc. Um, so, but I'm not aware of any any new legally binding agreements. Um, that would be on the on the pipeline. Neither am I um, aware of anything uh, anything formal uh, to be to to take place between between the the Arctic Economic Council and and the Arctic Council. And and to some extent, I think that if you think about the the, the structure of the Arctic Council, it's very difficult to 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 even start thinking how could they be in what position they could be in so that was the because now the, the arctic arctic economic councils kind of a structure kind of mirror mirrors the the arctic council so there are also parliament participants and, and member state nominated uh, representatives so so basically what i have personally suggested is that, is that uh, couldn't we do the same for instance for the for the subnational governments, that they would have their own forum, because at the moment they cannot be fitted in into the Arctic Council, because Arctic Council um, has already the permanent, permanent participants, which would, I'm pretty sure that they would block any major revisions to the structure, because they it, it serves them so well at the moment, and obviously permanent participants are to some extent. Um, let's say they are slightly concerned also of the of the increasing influence of this ever increasing kind of a group of observers. So there is 39 observers already, 13 country observers. So perhaps not so much at the moment. So much it's it's not so much about the their actual kind of participation etc but that they are there in the meetings and they their their resources are enormously bigger than permanent participants so so but then there are kind of uh, also kind of a practical ways to overcome that so so for instance finland 
uh, made its chairmanship program in a way that it was done together with the Arctic Economic Council. And you can see if you read, it's in the web, you can re read the Finnish chairmanship program and, and the Arctic Economic Council comes up almost <laughs> in every page. So, so functionally the chairmanship can, can kind of take it forward, but they still remain as independent um, independent institutions and, 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 and are likely to remain so. Um, okay, uh, we have another question here, if you're still there, Timo. Uh, yeah. Okay, good. I thought we'd lost you for a moment then. Uh, <laughs> from uh, Irina, uh, who says, thank you for the lecture. Um, you're welcome. Uh, well, not from me, but uh, uh, <laughs> so she asks, uh, what is the role of the observers in the Arctic Council? And some observers hardly uh, attending meetings, I think she means, for example. So what is the role of observers? So, so basically, the, the, there's to some extent there is kind of a, um, some misunderstandings about the, the the role. So, so, so their role, and this is very clearly when 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 these internal rules were revised, it was made clear that observers participate in the working group level, and obviously there most of the work in any case in the Arctic Council is being done. So, so they can participate there where the core activities of the Arctic Council are being taken. They are, um, it's a very varied bunch of, of entities. So, so you have China and then you have, you have WWF Arctic and, and so, so you have a enormously different types of entities participating as observers so 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 basically still on the premise that that they are being treated equally but they do participate and they they invest money in 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 in, in various projects and um, there was now this kind of a ceiling set for for how much they can because in in at some point in time the 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 observers were were um investing in even even more in the projects within the arctic council because most of the work is done through the projects that are then funded by different stakeholders and mostly it is member states and then and then the the, the observer non-arctic states for instance or then then some other observers so there was a ceiling set that that the 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 the, the funding from the the observers cannot exceed the, the the total fund total investments that the Arctic Eight uh, make, but but uh, in practice it is very difficult to track whether that that is that is uh, happening. So they do participate in different projects. They sponsor th these. They have a lot of Arctic expertise. Obviously, there are uh, some of the countries have been there from the big. They have they have participated in the in the negotiations of. Of the the Arctic Environment Protection Strategy from from let's say 1988 onwards, so obviously they have lots to give to the council, and and then perhaps one example as to as as a, a kind of a good good example at at least to to my mind is is the 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 framework program that is now um, ongoing to to um, curb. Uh, methane and, and, and black carbon um, climate climate change mitigation measure um, uh, a project. Uh, well, it's not a project; it's a framework program. But 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 there, the countries are are expected to provide their own submissions of 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 how much black carbon, for instance, they have they have uh, um, they have um, uh, um, produced and 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 and. Uh, and those submissions are are coming also from 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 many of the the big observer countries. So that's a a good example that it, that 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 the 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 observer activities is going to the to the right direction. 
Okay, thank you. Uh, so we at the moment don't have any new questions um, unless somebody is going to submit one any moment. Uh, but I think, oh, there we go. Oh no, <laughs> it's not a question. It's just a comment from Heidi, just to say mm -hmm. thank you to uh, Timo. Thank you. Uh, okay, so I think we'll uh, we'll wrap up now. Um, I'd like to say thank you very much to Apex for um, allowing us to use their webinar system uh, to arrange this um, this webinar, this EPB Apex webinar. Uh, I'd like to Thanks thank also from me. I'd like mm -hmm. to thank all the. Uh, Participants who joined, I think we had the uh, we had a very healthy turnout uh, uh, again for this webinar. So there's obviously a lot of interest in uh, Arctic governance and polar governance uh, in general. And thank you also from my behalf. Most of all, <laughs> I'd like to thank uh, I'd like to thank Timo for a, a excellent excellent webinar. Thank you and thanks thanks to everyone who participated and. And of course, also to EBP and 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 up uh, Apex. So so, this is also also interesting for me, as a as a personal experience, to be talking in a, in this in this virtual world. Yes, uh, it's a, a little bit a little bit different than what you might be used to. <laughs> um, so uh, just as a final note, this webinar has been recorded, so um, it will be available online very soon on uh, the European Polar Board website at europeanpolarboard.org and it will also appear on the Apex website I'm sure um, and I'm sure you'll be able to uh, able to find find it if you if you want to recap um, so thank you very much everybody and uh, you. goodbye thanks bye bye